That is a good problem. So good to see you this morning. Welcome to all of you. I don't think we have any first-time guests, but we're all good people, aren't we? Yes. Say yes. What I want us to do this morning is let's stand and give each other. food and good fellowship and good program so it was a wonderful time Heck, congratulations to you further evidence that horizon is much alive and doing some very good things ushering in the the new day can keep keeping the ball rolling um, reminding too um, to this afternoon a group of us is going to be meeting to plan some summer youth activities mm -hmm. Kathy and Sam and Braden and Trent and me Anyone else that would like to come and be part of that planning group, you're welcome to come. We're meeting at 5 today. May the 12th is Mother's Day, baby dedication. If any of you know of anyone that has a child they would like to dedicate, we'll be happy to include them in that service next Sunday. Then Graduate Recognition Day is, is uh, May the 19th, so we're looking to recognize any graduates from high school or college that may be part of our church family as well. If you have a member of your family that would like to come and participate, we'll be happy to have them come as well, even though they're not attending here or members here. We'll be happy to share with them that time. The Memorial Day service on the 26th, keep that in mind in the bulletin. If you know of any relative or someone in your family that was that lost his life during the time of military service, let us know. We'd like for them to be involved in that. And then um, let's continue to pray for the pastor search committee. The survey went out this week. I hope surely all of you have that, and maybe you've already turned it in. If you haven't, I hope you'll mail it in and encourage others to do the same. It's a very exciting time in the life of the church, and uh, we're looking forward to those good things. Today uh, we start restart Children's Church again. And uh, I'm glad to see some children present with us who will come and participate in that. And um, any of you who are entering your second childhood and would like to come down, <laughs> we'll, um, we'll, help you, we'll help you get up after we sit down on the steps. And uh, that'll be great. Okay, it's great to be together today. God bless you as we continue our worship. Please stand for the call to worship and remain standing for our opening prayer. Let's pray together. Indeed, Lord, we're so grateful today to come and worship a glorious God, a God who has created the world and its beauty and its good, 
with all its natural resources for the good of your choice creation, human beings such as us. We thank you for that great, powerful, marvelous creation. But we're also thankful, Lord, that you are the redeeming God who understands and accepts the fact that we are fallen creatures and you receive us into your heart, into your life, and allow your spirit to come and live within us, to give us new life, new birth, that we may become the children of God and be your agents in this world. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege today to gather with these, your people. We pray your divine blessing upon us. We pray that in this hour today, we will, all of us, each of us, pause to praise the God who has blessed us in such marvelous ways. We do confess, Lord, that we are frail, that we think many thoughts and commit many deeds that are misdeeds and not considerate thoughts, and we say things that we should not say. Those are the things that, are, that plague our lives, and yet we pray your divine forgiveness and grace that today will be a better day than yesterday and that tomorrow will even be better than today. Thank you, Lord, for this fellowship, for our heritage, for what's behind. Thank you for what lies before. Thank you that you are at work in this congregation to do marvelous things. Thank you in advance that you will provide spiritual leadership, devoted and committed for the days to come. Thank you that what we lose does not define our lives, for there is always to be gained in your grace and in your presence. And so now we pray your blessings on this hour. Lead us that our thoughts might be lifted upward so that our lives might be lived closer to you. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Please remain seated as we sing our next hymn, Heavenly Sunlight, number 317. <laughs>
All right, will the children come forward for our children's moment? I am so thankful for you beautiful girls today. If you weren't here, I wouldn't. Oh, and this gentleman, have a seat right here on the steps with me. If y'all weren't here, I wouldn't have a children's sermon. I'd just be sitting here talking to myself. Y'all know what this is? Baseball, right? Yeah. I know you know what it is. You play baseball, don't you? What position do you play? Outfield? Mm -hmm. Good. What's your batting average? I mean, you know, without boasting. You get one out of every two at-bats, you get a base hit? <laughs> Let me ask you this. Do you ever strike out? You do? You strike out? Oh, my goodness. That's not good, is it? <laughs> How does it make you feel when you strike out? Okay, it doesn't bother you too much. I look forward to the next time. Okay. Y'all go to this game? Y'all go to baseball game? Do you? Yeah, you, you you encourage him and don't underestimate the power of a sister. Okay, there we go. Uh, you played basketball, you said, right? Last year. Okay. Sports is very important. This, of course, is baseball. I'm going to give that one to you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I found it. So it's not, it's not anything big. Near my house is a baseball field where the Rayburn County baseball team plays, and they occasionally hit one over the fence into the woods. That's where I walk. So I retrieve balls there. So anyhow, enjoy that. I don't think it's waterlogged. I think it got, may have gotten rain down, but I think it feels pretty good. You know, I want to tell you about baseball just a little bit. Of course, the Braves lost last night. Do you all watch the Braves on TV? You watch the Braves? A little bit? Well, they lost to Los Angeles. But anyhow, um, when, you, when, you, when you strike out, uh, some people, when they strike out, get real upset, throw the bat, and all that kind of stuff. You don't do that, do you? No. Um, striking out is, is not a big problem. It's really not. Is it? It's part of baseball, isn't it? I mean, you don't hit everything that's pitched to you. No. no. And uh, so, and sometimes the umpire misses a call. Does that ever happen in any of your games? Yeah. <laughs> Mine too. Um, so, uh, but a, a guy named Babe Ruth, y'all remember that yeah. name? Babe Ruth. Okay, ba Babe Ruth played back in the 20s, uh, late, early 20s, mid 20s. The guy struck out 1,300. And 30 times in his career. Can you believe that? 1,330 strikeouts in his career. Uh, by the way, he also held a record for number of home runs he hit, 714. He held that record until 1974 when a guy named Hank Aaron hit number 715, okay, in Atlanta, Fulton County Stadium. He was a brave. Woohoo! <laughs> At any rate, my point is this, if you have a strikeout, you have to overcome the strikeout, okay? That's it. You've got to overcome that. Forget it and go back to the plate. Sister's saying, I'm telling you, that's what she's trying to tell him. Just don't let it get, <laughs> don't let it get you down. There's people on my team that tell me when they strike Do what? out. There's people on my team that tell me when they strike out. I don't know. What, they cry when they strike out? Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Oh, my. You don't, though, do you? No. But at any rate, you've got to overcome the strikeouts. You've got to overcome the bad times. I do have trouble with it. You do, but he has trouble with it. Okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to keep working on little brother. All right. What I have for you all today is a, is a cupcake. I want to share them with you. And I want you to take one with you. You can eat it here or, or wherever you want to eat it. Um, okay. Very good. Okay, enjoy. All right, very good, great, enjoy. Uh, if you drop something on the floor, these things are little sparkly things. We'll pick those up. All right, guys, great to be with you today. Thank you for coming forward. Come back next week, we'll have some more goodies, okay? All right, good, thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>
<laughs> Since you're having goodies, you might want to bring your friends, too. <laughs> Have a big crowd down here. Please stand, if you will, for our offertory hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that we have to come to worship you, Lord. Thank you for each and every one that is here today. And may they receive the message that John gives and they get um, something from all the music that is being sung today, Lord. Bless this tithes, these tithes and offerings and let us use them, God, to glorify you uh, and to just help us to uh, be the Christians that we need to be throughout this community. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Please stand for the doxology. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy I'm no great musician, I'm a good musician, no, I'm not even a good musician, and I've listened to a lot of music, and I think that choir is good. What do you think? And thank you for that today. 
Back at Rabin Gap, where we're members, our congregation is about 250. We're having two services on Sunday, just, just overflow, building a new building for five and a half million dollars. Uh, things are going really good. I talked this week, I was in a meeting there, and I talked with the Minister of Music. We sat together, and I told him about our choir, and he said, wow. That's one thing we don't have in our church is a big choir. I told him about the number of men in our choir and the quality of their singing. And he said, I'd kill for that. <laughs> oh, my. We're blessed. We really are blessed. We really are. Uh, let the word get out. You know, sh tell everybody that, hey, we have a good choir, and you ought to hear them sing. Maybe they'll come and hear them sing in spite of the preaching, right? Last Sunday, I talked about dreaming, shared some of those songs from the 50s and 60s, you know, Dream Lover, all those great songs. Boy, I tell you, they were something else. Um, I heard it said many times in those years, that rock and roll is of the devil. And those kids that listen to that stuff are going to warp their minds well, I listen to it. Draw your own conclusions from that. Can't help it. But think of the great lyrics of some of those songs of the 50s and 60s. Oh, the great lyrics. Listen. Remember Shaboom? Oh, listen to that one. Shaboom, shaboom. Yada da, yada da, yada da, yada. Shaboom, shaboom. Now, where can you find lyrics like that? I mean, really. As far as I know, the only language that can interpret that or translate it is love language. Yeah, shaboom. And, and how about this one? Tutti Fruity. Little Richard. Folks, it doesn't get any better than that. Tutti Fruity, ah, Rudy. A wop, bop, a loo bop, a lop, bam, boom. Now, think of that. Ah. I mean, what is it? Jim, have you, are you, can you sing that song? <laughs> if you'll work on that, we'll listen. <laughs> Hubie, Hubie, can you, can you do Little Richard stuff? I think only Little Richard can do Little Richard stuff. Oh, boy. How about the witch doctor song? The guy was in love, you know, and he didn't know what to do. So he, he went to the witch doctor to find out what to do. And this is what the witch doctor said. Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah. <laughs> Ching, shang, walla, walla, bing, bang. I mean, really, if that doesn't stir the soul. But the one that really stirs the soul is the title. The title of it is Who Put the Bomp? Remember that one? Who put the bump in the bop to dop to loop or whatever, bump? Who put the ram in the ram -a lama ding dong Who put the bop, bump in the bop to bop shabop? Who put the dip in the dip to dip to dip? If your heart is not stirred right now, you may be beyond help. And, and the, the, the thing closes out and says, um, the, my, this, these songs, um, I'd like, who was that man? I'd like to shake his hand. He made my baby fall in love with me. Just those words. I'm not sure why Linda fell in love with me. I don't think it was those words. As a matter of fact, she didn't like rock and roll very much. She had to listen to it when she was with me because I like I liked it. Well, that older generation was pretty sure we weren't going to amount to much. And here we are. <laughs> yeah. Along with long hair. Remember long hair in the 70s? Boys wearing long hair. Over there in Clanton, Alabama, a guy walked down the street with hair over his ears. 
Everybody stands back. No telling what's growing in that hair. And watches. Where is he going? He goes into the barber shop, has a hair trim. They say, well, thank goodness, finally. He comes out. It didn't seem like he cut anything off. I mean, the older generation was pretty sure that generation would not come out of it. But they did. They overcame. They overcame. Overcoming. I'm an overcomer. So are you. We're all overcomers. We've had to overcome some things. I had to overcome provincialism. I grew up in Clanton, Alabama. I didn't get out of the state of Alabama until I was 18 years of age. I wanted to. I wanted to escape Alabama. But there I was. Well, the Baptist Church was my social club, my social group, my friends, school. At church, however, I discovered something that really made a difference in my life, and that was Christ. I discovered Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. At an early age, he came into my life, and, um, you know, it was almost like, yeah, well, so much for that. Let's move on. But in the years since, I'm going to tell you, it's been the big thing. It's been the big thing. Overcoming is something we do as Christians. We overcome. Or else, we are overcome by what comes our way. Some people are overcome. I've known people who are simply overcome to start with. Home they grew up in was just too much or too little, they said. The influences they had were just too strong, they said. And so they were overcome. They didn't have the power, the strength, the will, or whatever it is they did not have to overcome those influences at life. And that's sad. That is sad. When we pray, we need to pray for those people out there in our world. That's why we're here. We're on mission to those people. We're here to represent another way, the overcoming way. Life can be a wonderful adventure, or it can be a struggle to survive, or both. A journey to overcome, or a journey in which you experience one disappointment, one defeat after another, or both. Some people have it tough. I mean, really tough. We had a dear lady at our, one of our congregations where I served years ago. Her name was Norma. Norma was a member of our senior adult group, went on trips with us and so forth, but she shared with me that at home she had a husband that kept the clamps on her. He would allow her to go on those meetings but he, and, and to go to church, but she had to give an account for everything. She was not a free person in her marriage, in her home. And she was in her 60s, early 60s at that point. She loved to play the harmonica, and she would bring her harmonica on our trips and our senior adult trips. We'd go to different places. I drove the bus for them. We had a great time. She'd play her harmonica on the bus. She said, when I go home, I'll hide that. He doesn't know I play it. He won't let me play it now. In the passing of time, and time does pass, her husband died. Everybody moves on some point. When he died, she did not lament. She rejoiced. Sorry about that. You know what she did? She got a harmonica. Started playing that harmonica at home every day. She said, I'm free. I'm free. After 37 years of marriage, Norma She overcame by simply hanging in there, enduring, 
getting through it. Today, I want to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul got through it too. He was the apostle of Christ to the Gentiles. Went throughout the Gentile world preaching the good news, sharing in Christ, building churches, and starting churches, and so forth. He was hated for it. He was opposed by it. He was opposed by the Judaizers who, who opposed the gospel, who opposed Christ. They did not accept that Jesus was the Messiah. And so in every turn, he was, he was in difficulty. And so he, he talks about his ministry. He talks about what he's felt and what he goes through. Let me begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, and give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Now here's our key passage here. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not us. Isn't that wonderful? This treasure of God is in our hearts and in our minds and on our lips, and this, this who we, what we represent, and yet we recognize that we carry this in a, in a frail body, in, in a jar of flesh, and a jar of clay. And so we are the flesh. And so it, the purpose of that is to show that the power of that is not of us, but of God. God is demonstrating his power through us, or maybe in spite of us, often. That's, that's the glory of God. All right, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. We who are alive are always being given over in, to death in, for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Going down to verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. That's what, that's what enables us to to move through and get through things. We, we focus, we look, we fix our eyes on the unseen instead of what we see, instead of what we experience in the moment. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Overcoming. We are overcomers. There are certain things that overcomers will not say. An overcomer will not say this. These things that are happening to me are just overpowering. I can't overcome it. We will not say that. Overcomers never say that. We always say, it's difficult, man. What I'm going through is not easy. It's tough. But I'm not going to quit. I have a good friend down in Conyers, Georgia, who was one of my deacons in one of my congregation, we were close friends. We are about the same age. I'm a little bit older than him, one year older than him. When I was his pastor, Head and I played tennis regularly. 
I tried to get him to play golf, but he said, nah, I just play tennis. When he retired, he started playing golf. So I'd go down and play golf with him occasionally. Since he started late in life, he was not very good. So I beat him like a drum. <laughs> he used to beat me on the tennis court, run me around. I, I thought I called that unmerciful, his treatment of me. So we had a lot of fun. He's a great guy. Ed now has ALS. ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Ed is not going to make it. He's bedridden. He has absolutely no motor control. No use of the hands. He cannot do anything. He can still eat. Breathing fair with oxygen. Future is very bleak. I visited with him last week. On Tuesday evening, I went by to visit with him, and I said, Okay, Ed, how's it going? He said, It's going good. <laughs> He's not in denial. He's not in la-la land. That's Ed. It's the you. That's the Christ inside of me. I said, Okay. I said, I've been playing golf today with my brothers. I beat them. I won. He said this to me. He said, I'm, I'm going to get up pretty quickly. I'm going to start practicing again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat you one more time. He said, in his eyes, he's looking. I'm going to beat you. I said, Ed, I hope it happens. I hope it happens. I'm going to hang in there hoping that that happens. I'm going to pray that it happens. He said, I am. I'm going to beat you one more time. Wow. He's a winner. He's a winner. Oh, he has ALS. He's not going to live very long on this world, in this world. But man, he's a winner. And that's what it's about. What it's about. Winners, overcomers, never say, this thing that I've got, this thing that's happening to me is just too much. We don't say that. We say it's tough, we face the fact, I don't like it, it's not good, but I can handle it. We have people here this very morning sitting in this sanctuary with us. That's their attitude, I guarantee you, I see it. People who come here with great difficulty, they serve on committees, they still come to the committee meetings, inspire us with their walkers, because they're overcomers. Another thing that overcomers do not say is, I, I don't have what it takes to fight this. They do not think that they can't do it. They do not think that they do not have what it takes. They believe they can do it. A good example in the scripture is the 12 spies of, that uh, Joshua, that Moses sent to the promised land to check it out. Ten of those guys came back and said, oh, boy, those people are big and there are a lot of them and there's no way we can take them. We just need to back off. We can't go there. It's already occupied by some bad people. But Caleb and Joshua, Caleb and Joshua, thank God that in most of the contexts that I've been in in my life, there was a Caleb and a Joshua, or a Joshua. Somebody that said, no, nah. we can take them. Let's do it. Caleb said, we can go up today. And so they held a boat. Now, careful about boats. <laughs> God doesn't always get the boat. <laughs> Courage doesn't always get the boat. Overcoming doesn't always get the boat. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we have to say, wait a minute. That's not where I am. I believe we can do it. Let's do it. And that's what they did. In time. But it took years before they were able to overcome. But overcomers echo what Caleb and Joshua said. We are well able. That's who we are. We are able because we are God's people. 
We're not weak people. We're not wimps. We're not cowards. We're not hopeless. We can do it. It's good to say that. It's good for congregations to say that, for churches to say that. Folks, we can do it. That's, what's, that's the spirit I see here at this great church. You people are saying, we can do it. We're going to do it. Absolutely. That's who we are. That's what we're called to do. And then there are other, there's another thing that you never hear overcomers say. You never hear them say, this is not really a fight at all. I mean, you know, life is just a dream. Shaboom, shaboom. <laughs> just a dream. It's just a mirage. It's not really a battle. And so you just abdicate and you don't accept the battle and you just let, you know, drift and find a way to live life without fighting, without battling. No way to live life. Have to face things head on. Back in the early, uh, back in the late 60s, I was selling vacuum cleaners with Electrolux Corporation. Any of y'all ever owned an Electrolux? Several smart people here today. <laughs> they were once great. I visited with Mrs. War. Mrs. War was in my hometown of Clanton. She was a retired sixth grade teacher. For, no, yeah, sixth grade teacher from the elementary school. I was never in her class. But I, was, I knew her and knew her life somewhat. And I visited with her and sat on her porch, and she had another, she had an off-brand, and she didn't want, wasn't interested in my brand. And, but we sat and talked a while. She said, oh, I'm so glad you came by. Good to talk with you. She started ta saying things like this. It's young men like you that give me such promise for the future. She didn't know me. But I told her a little bit what I was doing. I was, I was committed to the ministry, going to college, trying to make a little money to buy groceries with. <laughs> I could tell you about my first church where I was serving at that time. They had me on a percentage basis, salary-wise. So if the, if the take was $50 on a Sunday, I got 25% of that. 25% of $50 is a little over $15. Pretty good. Our grocery bill was about $7 a week. And gas was about five dollars in those days, so we were solvent. And so we talked about those things, several things. She's and her position was this: life is wonderful. Things are getting so much better in our country and in our world. She said, "I believe that in fifteen or twenty years, we're going to have a world of perfection. People are going to love one another. There'll be no more wars." She said, I see it happening. I sat there rocking on her front porch with her. She had a rocking chair and I had a rocking chair. And I thought, Lord Jesus, what am I hearing? It didn't jive with what I had, had believed about the world in which we live. I thought people were sinners until saved by grace and that wars and rumors of wars came about because of the lusts of people's lives and all of those things which are scriptural and are true. I wish Mrs. War had been right, but she was not. There is a fight to be fought. Life is not a dream. So then, according to Paul's experience here, let me briefly say there are a couple of things that Paul said he has experienced as an overcomer. Overcomers experience, first of all, tribulation. Tribulation is a good word. It's a big word. In the scripture, it comes from the Greek word, which means pressure. Pressure. You and I are undergoing constant pressure. We have pressure from that which is happening around us. We have that Pressure from that which is happening within us. Constant pressure. Pressure is a part of that life. Tribulation for God's people simply means the pressure of being a Christian in the world today. 
Here's what it's like, Paul said. I mean, you know, I'm pressed on every side, but not crushed. I am uh, perplexed, but not in despair. I am persecuted, but not abandoned. I am struck down, but not destroyed. Pressure. Pressure. And the pressure just keeps on coming. It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away when you retire, Eddie. You simply have a new list of things to do. <laughs> pressure doesn't go away because you reach a certain age in life or because you reach a certain state in life. Not at all. Pressure is there. Pressure is a part of life. And so we deal with that. Always under pressure. We accept it. G. Campbell Morgan tells the story of having a young preacher preach in his congregation. And the young preacher was full of zeal and enthusiasm and preached a marvelous sermon. And after the sermon, someone was saying, boy, that was a good sermon. He is a very good preacher. And Morgan said, my wife said this. Yes, he'll be even better when he suffers a little. He'll be even better when he suffers a little. I don't like suffering. I don't like having gone through some of the stuff that life brings to us. I don't like some things that happen in church occasionally. You can get hurt in church. You can get hurt at a baseball game. You can get hurt anywhere. Church is no different. I don't like that. None of us like that, do we? But when we suffer through things, it changes us. And God's people are changed not for the worse, but for the better. Maybe in the long haul, for the better when we suffer. In the short haul, we feel like we're going to die. But in the long haul, we grow. We learn something. If nothing else, we learn that we can overcome. We learn to trust in God to get us through. That's good. That's good. Tribulation. That's an experience. The last thing is hope. We learn hope. We experience hope. Paul said in 17 and 18, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. That's what I'm talking about. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. We fix our eyes. King James translation says we look, not at what is seen, but what is unseen. We lift up our eyes. On the way to the church on Sunday mornings, I, I turned to Willie's Roadhouse on Sirius Radio and, and listened to that, that Ranger Bob program. Oldies, great old western songs and talk. It's wonderful. Today they played Gene Autry. How many of y'all remember Gene Autry? There again, it's a generational thing. I understand, Bucky, you don't know who Gene Autry is. It's all right. We don't expect you to. Gene Autry singing this song. There's a gold mine in the sky. He said, it's bigger than the state of Texas. Now, if you're a Texan and you admit that, you're talking about heaven. There's a gold mine in the sky. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a gold mine in the sky. And I'm a gold digger along with you. We're going to be there someday. We look there. Our eyes are focused there. That's what he says. We look 
we fix our eyes on what is seen, not what is seen, rather, but what is unseen. We're looking at it to see it. Hope then looks at the ultimate. He says in chapter 5, verse 1, to follow this, he says, Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Oh, we know that. We have a house, a house not built by human hands. Eternal in the heavens. We're moving out. We're going to move out. Glory. Yes, we shall overcome. In the 1960s, the Civil Rights Movement adopted the song, We Shall Overcome, as the rally song. The lyrics went something like this, We shall overcome someday. We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I know, I do believe, we shall overcome someday. We shall be all right someday. We shall be all right someday. Deep in my heart, I know, someday we shall be all right. We shall live in peace someday. We shall live in peace someday. Deep in my heart, I know, someday we will live in peace. And that song propelled them to move forward being crushed and perplexed, cursed, spat upon, bloodied. I was in Alabama during that time. I, my home is about 45 miles from Selma. During the time of the march over, over the bridge, over the bridge and march from Selma to Montgomery, I was pastor of a church and student in college and pretty well stayed oblivious to what was going on. I was not that sympathetic. I was not as angry as a lot of people, but I was not that sympathetic. I have since come to see that there was a great movement, a movement that we needed to do in this country. Because you see, those people saw something. The only way you can see what they saw was to be their color. They saw ultimate truth, ultimate peace, ultimate right, ultimate justice. They saw it. They fixed their eyes on it and sang the hymns of the faith as they made that march and as they went through all the various things they did. I'm not trying to stir anyone's feelings about anything today it's simply to say whatever your journey might be whatever your challenges may be I want to assure you that you shall overcome and sing that song to yourself claim that as your gift from God we shall overcome May God bless us today as we move forward, his people, doing his thing in the world. May we pray together. Father, thank you so much for the riches of your word, for the greatness of those people who went before us, for the Apostle Paul, his stewardship, his dedication, his intellect. Oh, it's amazing. And he set for us an example. Surely, we can now look forward, as he did, that the Father's house is prepared for us. We keep our eyes there as we keep our feet firmly in the journey, moving forward, confident of the ultimate hope that we have in Christ. God bless this precious congregation and each of us here today that we shall indeed be your people in every aspect of life. In Christ's name we pray. So our hymn of invitation today is um, Day by Day, a hymn of response. I invite you to come if you'd like to come and join the church by letter, by statement, if you're dedicating your life or come on profession of faith for baptism, it would be good for you to do so. May we stand together and sing.
be together today. You know, the behavioral psychologists say that there are two major influences that determine a person's life, heredity and environment. What we inherit from our families, what we genetically, or how we're composed, what we, how we're put together that's beyond our control from our parents, our grandparents, and on down through the years. DNA test can reveal all of that. So it's real. That's a big thing. The other is environment. The environment we grow up in, the environment we're part of. That helps to shape, or that does, they say, shapes everything. There's even been a debate between the two. Which is the dominant one, heredity or environment? What determines a person's capacity to, to be a winner or to be a loser? To be an overcomer or to be overcome? Well, beyond behavioral psychology is a third dimension. And that's the choice of the individual. I've known people who grew up in the worst possible family circumstances, the worst possible. And they made great decisions. One of my friends was in one of those kinds of situations. I could go into detail telling you all about his family background, and <laughs> you, you'd almost be bored with the stories. It's just unbelievable, and yet. He graduated high school, and he became the first person in his family to graduate high school. <laughs> then he went to college on a scholarship, several scholarships. I helped him to get some of those. I helped him get in touch with some people. And he became the first person in his family to graduate college. And today he's a successful business person. One of the first things he did was to get his mother and dad out of a tent almost into a nice house paid for it for them. Because he made some choices. He made some critical choices. And the first critical choice he made was in vacation Bible school in our church where he accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. Don't kid yourself. Choices, I think, makes all the difference. Thank God for your choices. Thank God we have the privilege of helping boys and girls make right choices. May the peace of God be with you today. The grace of our Father, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless you.